Hey everybody, I wanted to take this Memorial Day as an opportunity to go over some of the laws for war. So I'm just going to start reading all of the laws that talk about warfare. So this is from Deuteronomy 20. If you want to read along, Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 10 through 14. John 10, 11 through 13. And Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. So I'll start with the first one, Deuteronomy 17. So this is about laws concerning kings. Starting in verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell within it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes, and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Skipping forward a few chapters to Deuteronomy 20, starting in verse 1. When you go out to war against your enemies, and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And is there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man enjoy its fruit. And is there any man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further to the peoples and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. And when the officers have finished speaking to the people, then commanders shall be appointed at the head of the people. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. But the women and the little ones, the livestock and everything else in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as plunder for yourselves, and you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the nations here. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save nothing alive that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, and so you sin against the Lord your God. When you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Are the trees in the field human, that they should be besieged by you? Only the trees that you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down, that you may build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. And then jumping forward into Deuteronomy 21 verse 10. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and shall remain in your house, and lament her father and her mother a full month, 
After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. And then John 10, I'll explain the reasoning why I'm including this in a second. John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Okay, I know that's a lot to take in, so bear with me. I'm going to offer a few key comments here. Just note a few things. We're not going to dive into detail on this. So the first one, let's apply this to the American government today. So at Deuteronomy 17, when it says laws concerning kings, there are three commands. In verse 16, he may not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt to acquire many horses. He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Which, which ones of these is the United States currently in violation of? I would say all three. So the many horses, that's military power. That was a tool of war. Why would you need to, to gather a whole bunch of horses if it was not... The, the idea here is that you don't want to have the means of committing war readily at your disposal. So I would take it that this is a standing army, that this is a prohibition against. Obviously, you can have people who are trained in war and they own everything, like the people can own the horses, but the king... The king can't own many horses, and he can't cause the people to go out and pay for the horses either. So he can't force them to go out and be taxed, basically, to go and acquire weapons of war. I would say that's that's the first thing that the United States is in violation of. You have tax money that's being paid to companies that are that are selling the United States weapons of war. So there's, there's strike one. Uh, strike two is many wives for himself. This is... Um, often used in the ancient world, a wife is a political alliance where the interests of the king are diverted because now he has bound himself, he has covenanted himself with a foreign nation. There are all kinds of treaties that the United States has with other nations. Obviously, I'm not equating America to God's nation. I'm just saying that this is something that we are living under and realizing it's, it's good to know the consequences of these things. And then the third one is, he shall not acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Um, I would say that the Federal Reserve is a violation of that on top of being other violation of other things, being sound money. Um, the commandments in Exodus saying that you shall have just weights and measures. The reason that I brought up John 10, where it says, a hired hand cares nothing for the sheep and flees, basically, whenever a wolf comes... That's something that the U.S. Constitution has sort of a tip of the hat to this. And it was because of King George III, who was not a native-born Brit. He was actually of a German house. That's good that the United States has this idea in place so that you can't have a foreigner come in and be beholden to uh, his people, a foreign a foreign people. So that is good in and of itself. I think the United States does a good job there with a disobedience to not ha the the king not having unlimited money, which would be, I guess, you could either say the president or Congress or uh, the Supreme Court or all three together, they have complete control over the money supply. Like, if they inflated the money supply enough, they could have access to literally all the buying power if they just printed enough money or did enough quantitative easing. If you don't know what quantitative easing is, it's basically when the Federal Reserve literally just keys in dollar amounts to... Um, certain accounts and stocks and basically just digitally inflates the money supply. There are more digital dollars than there are physical pieces of paper, and they can just do that. They do that, I believe, four times a year. They call it QE1234. I think they do it about once a quarter, and it's rather staggering how much they do it. So going to Deuteronomy 20, uh, laws concerning warfare. There are a few things to note here. This is, all war is religious in nature. Obviously, any war that Israel was supposed to take, Israel being uh, believers, 
people that have been brought into the faith by circumcision of the heart that have been grafted into the promises, the seed of Abraham, who is Christ. So the priest shall come forward and speak to the people. Well, we know that all believers are priests. It's basically, if you're in the right, don't fear. Israel never lost a war when they were in good standing with God. They won every single war when they were in good standing with God, and they lost every single war, no matter the people count, no matter anything. So basically the priests go out and they give a pep talk, uh, for lack of a better word. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or be in panic or dread. For the Lord God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Then the officers shall speak to the people. So here are some reasons if we're if we're going to apply this to the American military. Obviously, this is not God's nation. It's interesting to note where America goes wrong and to see the consequences of that. If America actually did these things and obeyed these things, America would see great prosperity. So if you just built a house, you can't be drafted, obviously. And there's no draft here because if you're just afraid, you don't have to go. So number one, it's a prohibition against the military draft because if you've dedicated, uh, haven't dedicated a house yet, if you have planted a vineyard and haven't gotten your first harvest from it, you're allowed to abstain. And also if you have taken your wife, there's another passage where it says that any man who takes a wife shall have uh, a full year without having to serve any public duty. That's Deuteronomy 24, 5. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. Numbers chapter 1 also talks about 20 as being the minimum age where a man is expected to go to fight in war in a just cause. So chapter Numbers chapter 1 verse 2, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the numbers of names, every male head by head from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war. You and Aaron shall list them company by company. So I think you're allowed to join the military at 18 in the United States, maybe possibly 17. I know that used to be the case with a parent's signature. I think that's that's horrible. 20 years old is a clear age. The king can't have unlimited money, unlimited full control over um, all military weaponry, can't have alliances with foreign nations. The king must be a native-born citizen, otherwise he won't care when adversity comes, like in John 10 with the shepherd who's taking care of the sheep and a wolf comes. He'll flee. There can be no conscription military draft. In the United States right now, we have the Selective Services Act, where you have to register to if in case they want to reinstitute a draft they've basically got all your information and can do it i think that's terrible 20 years old you can't join the military before then if you've been recently married within the last year you're not expected and i would say you should be actively discouraged from going to fight in a war same thing if you have just planted a field for the first time and you have not gotten to reap its harvest yet same thing, if you are fearful, you are allowed to abstain. Otherwise, you are expected to fight, and it would be a shame for you not to fight in a war if you are of age and none of these other things apply to you. So a war has been started. What's the first thing that you do? You go up to a city in verse 10. You, When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. So this is basically saying that whoever is in the wrong in a war must pay for the damage that they've done the city that it, that started the war repents, then all the people who are in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. So basically, they become slaves for what they've done. They started a war. They owe their service to the people that they attacked. That's only fair. Also, getting down to... Uh, if, if So if they don't, then you, you kill the males. The men are the ones who are responsible. And so that puts an onus on me America is liable right now if we actually started following these things and pulled out of a lot of different countries. I would be culpable just as every other man would be in the different cities that have made war against other other cities around the world. 
So there is a lot of judgment hanging over us, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we're not in the wrong here, and also realize that we may be enslaved at some point, and we need to be repentant. We are kind of already enslaved now just because of the taxes that are being taken from us to pay for these wars. So it's all these things that God's brought on us. It's our own fault. And we need to be repentant of it and realize this fact. So that changes my attitude now going forward. Now I don't just go out there and I hate on all the military or whatever. It's no, the reason that they're there and the reason that all this stuff is happening is because we've rebelled against God when it comes to how do we deal peaceably with people around the world? We haven't done a good job of that. And it doesn't necessarily matter that I haven't done it personally. I know some people have, but I haven't. But there are people out there that are representing me or claiming to represent me that have done these things basically in my name. And I've paid their paid their salaries. So it's it's basically a huge warning to us that we need to change the way that we're doing things. War is a basically a mass form of restitution so that if you go out and make war against another city trying to conquer it or attack it because you hate it well what's the penalty for that in deuteronomy 20 that city then is allowed to take your city to where you don't have it anymore and now you're still in you may still even be allowed to stay in your own land but now basically you're a slave so look for that pattern of enslavement and it's out there we have in the United States with paying taxes. That's a form of, that's basically wage slavery, debt slavery, and realize that. So then let's say you're in the military. What, what do you do? John the Baptist got this question in Luke 3. Um, so he quoted from a prophecy in Isaiah. It says, starting in Luke 3, verse 4, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Okay, now then note this next part in verse 12. Tax collectors, so government officials, basically the IRS came to be baptized by John the Baptist and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Quit the IRS and and uh, badmouth the government at all times. No, no. He said, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Wait, authorized by the IRS, the government? Yes. He said to them, don't collect more than you're authorized. Collect what you're authorized, because what you're authorized to do is God's judgment against people. And then verse 14, soldiers asked him, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Notice he didn't tell the soldiers to quit either. How do we reconcile that? Well, that tax money, that's a judgment that God had brought on Israel. The Roman government was a judgment on Israel for their disobedience. But then notice he said, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. So what if they had been sent over to fight a war against a nation for Roman conquest? John the Baptist is saying, you're not allowed to fight against those people. You're not allowed to use threats, unjustified threats against people. So that's a really interesting commandment to soldiers today, people who are in the military today. You're not allowed to fight in an unjustified war. Well, what justifies a war? They, it means that they, the other country or the other city, the other nation, has attacked the United States. If they have not done that, then a war is not justified by definition in Deuteronomy 20.